What's up, guys? Uh, I'm guessing a lot of people that were on here prior to 2019 or so, back when YouTube was actually really cool, saw the video saying when you die, don't go into the light. It's the trap. It's the trick used to keep you in this lower vibration. I've heard a few people mention it. Uh, but what if that was just kind of step one of the whole process? So this is kind of a deep subject. I, some people will think it's dark, something that's always fascinated me, probably a little too much, unhealthy, like. <laughs> but the Tibetan Book of the Dead describes the process of dying and being reborn, you know, reincarnation. And it describes that realm that you're in when you see the light. So it's it's really interesting. But I want to touch on a few things before we get into it, and if you want to skip my philosophy session, then I'll put a timestamp on the screen. First thing I want to talk about is the idea of eternity. How many people have sat down and actually thought about what that means? I was raised up going to church most of the time, and I remember hearing the concept of eternity and going home and it kept me up all night. It was the most terrifying concept, and still to this day, it is. And I still remember my thinking at the time, and it was, so you're telling me that in 1977, I flashed into existence out of nowhere, and now I've got this one life to live, and I mess up, then I spend eternity in hell. And not just that, but the fact that no matter how it goes, I'm here eternally, forever and ever. <laughs> and I seriously thought at the time, look, I didn't ask for this. I wish I would have just never been born if that's the case. I was like 14 years old, full of angst and anger and resentment and, you know, all of this bad stuff. And, uh, you know, I got to put up with this forever. It's just a terrifying thought to me. I had a friend once say something about being an immortal. And I said, would you really be an immortal if you had the chance? And he didn't even stop to think about it. Oh, yeah, man, of course. And I said, oh, okay, aside from the fact that you're going to watch everybody you know pass away and then another group of friends and they're going to be gone. And you might even try it as a loner for a little while. Or, I mean, say you conquer the whole entire world and the world is yours. That's going to get old after a while. There's a legend of a Judean who threw a rock at Christ on the cross. And guess what his punishment was? Immortality here on earth. So to be perfectly honest, the idea of eternal life isn't the most appealing thing to me. At least not on an earth that even vaguely resembles what we've got going on right now. Ah, you say, but what if you lived in a city of solid gold? Really? That's where it's at? A city of solid gold is heaven? I've had enough of cities in this lifetime. I really don't want to spend eternity in a golden city. And anybody that's sat there and thought about that for a minute should understand that's the most man-made idea of heaven that you could possibly have. I mean, you might as well throw in 72 virgins. Where I guess for every righteous man that goes to heaven, there's 72 that go to hell, and it's the same place, it's just that you're the virgin. But a bum bum -tch. The idea that the creator of the whole universe would want a city of gold instead of something more like Rivendell from Lord of the Rings doesn't make any sense to me. I think the people that run religions want gold more than God does. If that's what he's into, then why didn't he put a little more gold here on earth? Now, I'm not trying to knock anybody's religion here. It's never my intent to hurt anybody's beliefs. But I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it says you live one life and you go to heaven or hell. I know that upsets some people and they're telling me I'm doing the work of demons right now. But that would take a whole video to get into. I'm not going there. We don't know what happened to Jesus for 20 years of his life. And I could very easily make an argument that he went to India or even all the way to Tibet on the Silk Road. But this is a video on Book of the Dead, Reincarnation, so let's touch on Buddhism and Hinduism real quick because they both believe that we get reincarnated. Now, I've found both of these quote-unquote religions very interesting for a long time. I say quote because Buddhism is more of a philosophy 
but let's start with Hinduism. They have 330 million gods. And if you sit down and do the math on that, if you were at a dinner party and you met one god one minute apiece, you know, just, hey, how you doing? How's your mama? Who's your daddy? It would take you something like 66 years nonstop. That alone should tell you it goes back a long ways or there's somebody with full-time jobs of making up gods. And by their own accounts, the Ramayana took place like 7,000 years ago, the Mahabharata like 5,000. And in the Ramayana, I I may get a little bit of this mixed up, it's been a while, but uh, a demon kidnaps Rama's wife, and I believe he's the one that has the Vimanas, that flies down to Sri Lanka, and then Rama teams up with a bunch of monkey men, and they build a bridge over to Sri Lanka from mainland India, and it's still there today. It's called Adam's Bridge, and it's been proven to be man-made. And I, something I really respect about Hinduism is people worship all these different gods. They become a devotee to a specific god. All of them are different, and they all respect and get along with each other just fine. And just think about it for a second. If everybody on earth knew for a fact that they were going to be reincarnated, that everybody and everything was reincarnated, how long do you think the current power structure would be in place? I don't think very long. And I, I, I know for a fact that the world would be a much different place if everybody knew for sure that you were going to just keep coming back. So this isn't an idea that works very well for the people that control everything. It's also crossed my mind that with all these strange ceremonies and rituals we see, that, hey, do some people out there have the power to be able to reincarnate over and over and keep their memory? That's just a thought. But honestly, with Hinduism, I can't believe that they haven't revolted completely against this system yet. The Bhagavad Gita is the story of Arjuna, who is in the middle of a war with his cousins. But we're talking kingdom against kingdom. And he's out on the battlefield. He's all distraught about it. You know, he doesn't want to go to war with his cousins and slay them. And turns out his charioteer is Lord Krishna. So a very brief wrap up of what happens is he stops time and shows Arjuna the cycles of life, how you're constantly being born, you know. But Krishna basically tells him, look, don't worry about it. It's more important that you do your duty as a man and keep your dignity than going to war with these guys because, you know, they're not going anywhere. You can't actually destroy anyone. You're just moving them on to the next lifetime. So if that were definitely the case, wouldn't it, be worth it to spend however many souls it took to make the world a better place? I think a lot of things would change. I mean, there's a, what, maybe like a one in four chance that you're going to come back and live in an absolute squalor ghetto. I mean, even in America, you probably got a 50% chance of coming up in a single parent household. And ideas like, okay, we all want houses, but this one family gets to control all of these forest products, and we all want electricity, but another family gets to control all the electricity, in perpetuity would be gone. And more importantly, everyone would treat everyone and everything with more respect and compassion, which brings us to Buddhism, which says life is hard, life is pain. It's a long journey, so let's just all be nice to each other along the way. They call the reincarnation cycle samsara and say that you live Thousands and thousands of lives in all different forms. Now, I've heard it described a couple of different ways to where one way you your soul basically evolves up through, I guess, the insect kingdom to the animal kingdom to being a human. Um, but I've also heard it described as to where you can go back to the animal kingdom. But that is definitely regressing uh, as opposed to moving forward to the higher realms. But that can take thousands and thousands of lifetimes. And I think the literal definition of nirvana is to blow out. You just blow out. You're done with this samsara. Another way I've heard samsara described is at your moment of death, 
For instance, if you're really angry, you might come back as an angry dog. But the overall concept is karma. You know, you come back according to the deeds that you've done in your previous lifetimes. And to me, it does seem like a good system of cosmic justice. A lot of us have some baggage packed up and have had pain and suffering in this life. Now, just imagine if you had a thousand lifetimes of all that pain and suffering in your head and in your heart right now. Honestly, to me, the idea that you die and get a brain scrub and get to start over fresh in life is a mercy. You make your mistakes, you make some achievements, but you're not quite there to that next level yet, so... Why don't you try again? And oh, by the way, you're forgiven for everything that happened in your last life. You're not going to remember it. Hmm, that's one way of thinking of it. So it's got its merits, if you ask me. And it's also got a bunch of people that say that they can remember those past lives. And I'm not talking about somebody that says, I was Cleopatra, then Joan of Arc, and now I sell hot dogs. Supposedly, the Dalai Lama is the same person over and over I'm not going to get into that. It's been corrupted by the double CP, but there are a lot of llamas that say that they can remember past lives. And then you have stories like this kid who was evidently a pilot during World War II, and he remembers the old crew, and he knows all these details that a little kid would have no way of knowing. But there's a lot of things out there that the most obvious answer is that it's reincarnation. You know, I guess you could argue genetic memory or all these things, but the most obvious answer is reincarnation. And now, if that is the case, and people can remember their past lives like these llamas, well then, can some of them remember what was happening in between lives? And after the world's longest intro, that brings us to the Tibetan Book of the Dead. It goes into detail about all the different phases you go through, and whether or not you should go into the light. It's pretty trippy. Not gonna lie. Uh, just to put it in kind of a nutshell. First off, they're kind of having a priest whisper in your ear so that you know that that's what happened to you and that you're actually dead. Otherwise, you might not realize it on your own. Basically, you're in a realm of pure consciousness to face your demons according to your karma. You will be drawn towards what you deserve for your next life. If you've been really bad, then when you're coming by the hell realm, it will draw you. You'll be compelled to go there. In Buddhism, you can still mess up so bad that you get thrown in a hell realm. And I've even heard it said that it's likely that most of us have already been there a couple times. But there also seems to be several opportunities to transcend to higher dimensions. And I want to show you guys just how different our cultures are in regards to your mortal remains. I heard about sky burials a long time ago and didn't really think that much about it. They literally feed you to the birds. They're sometimes 20,000 feet above sea level with nothing but rocks around. But I guess the bones are tough on the birds, so they grab a sledgehammer and help out. And that's just a trip to me, and I'm sure a lot of you... Could you imagine doing that to somebody that you knew and cared for? Well, I'm sure they have designated people, and it's not a family member, but still, it's it's pretty brutal. Anyway, stage one, the bardo of the moments of death. And the primary clear light seen at that moment. Now, some people that have had special religious instruction at the time of being face-to-face -face with the clear light without any intermediate state, they will obtain the unborn Dharma Kiya Kaya by the great perpendicular path. So these are that's for the people that have been taught how to tip the doorman. Then they talk about some physical actions that a guru or someone who is trained to do this can can do for you. And what it is is getting your chi, your vital life force energy, to exit the body in a certain way way. The vital life force will have sunk into the nerve center of wisdom and knowledge, then thrown downwards through the right and left nerves, the intermediate state momentarily dawns. And it sounds like you're just kind of pinching off the chi and making it stay over in one area to leave the body to me. 
Anyway, this goes on for about the time of eating a meal, about 15 minutes. And if this has been applied efficiently, I guess it's a good thing. If it has been applied inefficiently, then address them thus. O nobly born, the time hath come for thee to seek the path in reality. Thy breathing is about to cease. Thy guru hath set thee face to face before with the clear light. And now art about to experience the reality of the Bordeaux state. I'm just going to Englishize this stuff. Wherein all things like the void and cloudless sky and the naked spotless intellect is like unto transparent vacuum without circumference or center. At this moment, know thou thyself and abide in that state. I too am here sitting with thee. They're to repeat this many times and then put them in the lying posture of a lion and block off the throbbing arteries. Arteries. So we're like at your very last breath right here. At, at this moment, the first glimpsing of the bardo of the clear light of reality which is the infallible mind of the Dharmakaya, is experienced by all sentient beings. Now, this state lasts a varying amount of time, depending on your constitution, good or bad, and the state of your nerves and vital force. Those with sound nerves and anyone who's practiced the dhyana, this continues for a long time. But those that have led an evil life or those of unsound nerves... The state only endureth as long as it would take to snap your fingers. And some people say it can be up to four days. If, when dying, one be by one's own self capable of diagnosing the symptoms of death, use of the knowledge should be should have been made heir to this before this. If, if a person is unable to do this, then a guru or a close friend should take the following steps. You tell the person, O nobly born, let not thy mind be distracted. That which is called death being come to thee now, re resolve yourself to this. O this now is the hour of death. Taking the advantage of this, I will so act for the good of all sentient beings, peopling, peopling the illimitable expanse of the heavens. This goes on for a little bit, and I don't think any of us are going to have a guru there to say all this, so we'll skip on ahead. But sticking to that resolution, thou should try to remember whatever devotional practices you are accustomed to. And then more physical help, pressing the nerve of sleep firmly, and a lama or person higher should impress these words on the departed, which is basically, hey, you're in the clear light, Bardo. Thine own intellect, which is now voidness, yet not to be regarded as the voidness of nothingness, but as being the intellect it's itself, unobstructed, shining, thrilling, and blissful, is the very consciousness, the all-good Buddha. Thy known consciousness hath no birth nor death, and is the immutable light. Knowing this is sufficient to keep thyself in the divine mind of the Buddha. The guru repeats that three to seven times, and hopefully it will cause the naked consciousness to be recognized as the clear light recognizing one one's own self one becomes permanently united with the dharmakaya and liberation will come so your guru is trying to help you to transcend and skip all of the rest of the cycles in the samsara here then comes the second stage and hopefully i haven't bored everybody to death because this is where it starts getting interesting but if step one failed and liberation was not attained, then there's the dawning of the secondary clear light. According to one's good or bad karma, the vital life force either flowed into the left or right nerve and go out through apertures. Then cometh a lucid condition of the mind. When the consciousness principle getteth outside the body, it saith to itself, Am I dead or am I not dead? It cannot determine. It sees relatives and connections that they're used to seeing before. It even heard the wailings. And the terrifying karmic illusion have, has not yet dawned. Nor have the frightful apparitions or experiences caused by the lords of death yet to come. That's where it gets trippy and a little bit scary because you 
no longer have a brain to use. You're just pure consciousness, so it sounds like you might not even know what has happened. Now, that's kind of scary, but I just want to say, if this is true, then that cute little puppy right there just went through this, so you'd be all right. Then the guru tells you, don't be distracted, concentrate on your tutelary, your guardian deity. And if they be common folk, which I guess is us, you meditate upon the great compassionate Lord. Now, those who have not been made familiar with this and were not able to recognize the bardo by themselves, and they need a guru to help them realize what's happening. And keep in mind, I, I think what they're saying is this is mainly like for your ticket to ascension. If you don't have a guru present to help you through all this, then you're just going to be reborn again. Not knowing whether he be dead or not, a state of lucidity comes to the deceased. And they kind of keep repeating the same things over and over, so I'm blowing through all that. But at this time, the special teachings can be applied, and they'll reach enlightenment again, insider trading. You've had two chances, you had not made it out, so now the third st stage of this is the karmic illusions come to shine. And at this time, you see all the people wailing and your friends and relatives there at your ceremony. And they call upon you, but you cannot call back, and so you go goeth away displeased. At that time, sounds, lights, and rays are experienced. These all frighten and terrify and cause much fatigue. And if you have a guru, he tells you of the six states of bardo, and that there are three bardos, the one at the moment of death, the bardo of experiencing reality, and the bardo of seeking rebirth. Up until yesterday, you've been through one of them, and you weren't able to grasp the clear light of reality. So pay undistracted attention, O nobly born. Do not cling in fondness and weakness to this life. Even though thou clingest out of weakness, thou hast not the power to remain here. Thou wilt gain nothing more than wandering, be not attached to this world, be not weak, and remember the precious trinity. It, I'll have to learn what the Buddhist trinity is. O nobly born, whatever fear and terror may come to thee, forget not these words. Alas, when the uncertain experiencing of reality is drawing upon me here, with every thought of fear or terror or awe, for all apparitions set aside, may I recognize whatever visions appear as the reflections of mine own consciousness. May I know them to be of the nature of apparitions in the bardo. When at this all-important moment of achieving a great end, may I not fear the bands of peaceful and wrathful deities, my own thoughts forms. Sounds a lot like you got to face your demons based off your karma. Now I'm thinking I want a guru to repeat these clearly, Thereby, whatever visions of awe or terror appear, recognition is certain. And forget not this vital secret art lying therein. When thy body and mind were separating, thou must have experienced a glimpse of the pure truth. Be not daunted thereby, nor terrified, nor awed. That is the radiance of thine own true nature. Recognize it. From that radiance, the natural sound of reality reverberating like a thousand thunders simultaneously sounding will come. That is the natural sound of thine own real self. Be not daunted thereby, nor terrified, nor awed. I interpret that as you're in a space with your true self, the knowledge of millions of lifetimes, and you're so, your true self is so dazzling, glorious, and radiantly awesome that it can reverberate with the sound of a thousand thunders, but you can't recognize it as your true self. It's so powerful that it terrifies you. But you are now in the thought body, and since you don't have a physical body, whatever may come, sounds, lights, rays, are unable to harm you. If you're unable to recognize your own thought form, the lights will daunt thee, the sounds will awe thee, and the rays will terrify thee. And now we'll have to wander in Sangsara. Okay, we're at 25 minutes here, and there's still a ways to go with this. And if you've listened this far, then you're probably down for a part two on this. 
And it's not just the clear light of reality in the first and second stages. There's a lot of steps to this. It's really interesting to me. But as far as going into the light, well, there's seems to be lights that will terrify you that you probably should go into because you'll go to nirvana. And then, like, the light to come back to Earth is like this dull glow, but it compels people to come back to Earth and be reborn again. And the whole point of these teachings is to not do that, to escape samsara. But if you can't, this goes all the way up to entering the womb. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Static out.